Welcome to Talk of Today, where we explore developments in science, technology, and society, and what they could mean for the future. I'm your host, Sam Barton. So we have uploaded our first video to YouTube and Facebook. It is on how much would it cost to crowdsource a solution to the clean energy crisis. And it's not as much as you'd think. We've got more content in the pipeline, so head to the Facebook page or YouTube channel and subscribe. Links will be provided on the show notes. The next video we've got coming is on the automation revolution. I'm also going to be uploading videos from some of the podcasts to YouTube as well. So you can watch my conversations with the fascinating people I chat to. So some of the topics for the podcasts that I've got coming up include The Death of Aging with Dr. Aubrey de Grey, who is Chief Science Officer at the SENS Research Foundation. The Future of Food and Lab-Grown Meat with Dr. Liz Specht from the Good Food Institute and Concussions with Dr. Fatima Nasrallah from the Queensland Brain Institute. Now on to the show. Over one billion years ago, two black holes merged. The collision of these galactic giants was so powerful that it created measurable distortions in the very fabric of the universe itself. These waves propagated throughout the universe, and last year, they passed through us. And it was the first time we had ever measured these waves, confirming the prediction Einstein made in his seminal work on general relativity over a century ago. With me to discuss this momentous achievement is Dr. Jess McIver, a postdoctoral scholar in experimental physics at the California Institute of Technology. So this conversation is a bit of a physics lesson. We discuss the basics of general relativity, what gravitational waves actually are, how they're created, and how do we measure them. And just a heads up, we did have some audio issues, which I have no doubt you will notice. Basically, there were just some loud, scratchy sounds throughout the entirety of the episode. I've done my best to edit them out, but there was only so much I could do, so just a warning. And without further ado, I bring to you my conversation with Dr. Jess McIver. I am Jess McIver. I am a postdoctoral scholar in experimental physics at Caltech in uh, California in the US. So I work on gravitational wave astrophysics, particularly the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO. So these are two gravitational wave detectors in the United States that sense these very small perturbations in the fabric of space-time. Yeah, try saying LIGO five times fast. I mean, <laughs> the... Uh... What if, I, I can't even re- repeat what you just said. It, it's early in the morning. <laughs> uh, so if we could just begin with a bit of an education on uh, general relativity and space-time and what uh, gravitational waves actually are. Are they the waves that propagate through the medium of space-time, if that's even the right way of looking at it? Um, so if you could just uh, begin by giving us a bit of a, a physics lesson and a, a brief history lesson, perhaps. Sure. So... All you need to know about general relativity to understand gravitational waves is that famous John Wheeler quote where something to the effect of matter tells space-time how to curve and space-time tells matter how to move. So gravity as we feel it is the curvature of space-time. And when I say space-time, this is the usual degrees of freedom that... Um, we experience in space, so you can move side to side, front to back, up and down, and whatever combination of these that you'd like. And it's it's these spatial degrees of freedom that are woven together with time to form space-time. So you can go anywhere in space, but time always marches forward. And this is sort of the, the fabric of um, reality, even. So you can think of it, space-time, as this stretched elastic fabric so if you put something heavy on it it will bend so if you have a trampoline and you put a bowling ball on it you'll get this this dip this and, dent and, and in this instance you mean heavy as in massive like the the more mass it has exactly so um you can think about our solar system so the or, the earth orbiting around the sun so it's following a straight line along space time and this is kind of like a i don't know if you have those funnel coin collectors in mm. Australia. Yeah, they, yeah, they yeah. Be, yeah. They're, they're, they're all over fun. your mall screen. Yeah, they're, they're great. So physics. if you take a coin, <laughs> yes, physics. 
if you take a coin and you roll it in a straight line around the edge, so it will it will go in a circle. It will follow the curvature of that surface. So this is just like orbital mechanics. So the force of gravity is is matter trying to move in a straight line in this curved space time. So. I guess planets or whatever, they're, they're constantly falling towards the source of the mass, but there's no uh, well, friction or anything, so they just keep falling. Is that, kind of, is that right? So, right, you're, you're thinking of your coin. So your coin doesn't keep going in a circle around this funnel. It will eventually fall in, and that's exactly right. It loses, it loses its energy, its kinetic energy, its, um, uh, which has to do with how much it's moving. Um, from friction. That's exactly right. And in the instance of, well, the warping of space-time and all that, uh, are we constantly uh, orbiting these things because, well, th- there is no energy being lost in that in, in transfer to the environment since, you know, space is basically a big vacuum so that it kind of happened, we, we just, we're, we're constantly falling towards the, the source of the, the gravity? Is that the right that way is... of looking at it? That is the right way of looking at it, and it's almost totally true. Um, so there's a really cool experiment that um, Holson Taylor at the University of Massachusetts did. Um, so one of the major, I would argue the major, of course I work on them. Um, so one of the predictions of general relativity is the existence of gravitational waves. So you have this stretched fabric of space-time, and if you introduce any perturbation to it, which means you're changing the distribution of mass in um and this is in some asymmetric way. So if I have a spinning sphere, that's not going to make gravitational waves. But if I have a spinning sphere with some some deformation on it, then I will. And the same goes for black holes and neutron stars and these really dense, compact objects out in the universe. As they're spiraling together, it's this asymmetric uh, matter distribution that's going to emit gravitational radiation. So the Holson-Taylor experiment observed this binary um, binary pulsar. So this is a neutron star with a companion. And what you can do, so a, a pulsar is a, it's a neutron star with a really, really strong magnetic field, and this shoots out... Do, do they spin of, extremely quickly? And like, Are they called pulsars because they... I, I could be very, very wrong, but they emit light. Or they spin very at a very very regular interval and very right. quickly, and they just like they're like flashing. Yeah, well remembered. Of... So the the magnetic Thanks field introduces the uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this really powerful jet of um, of electromagnetic radiation of light that that's emitted from their poles, and if you're oriented right with respect to them then that's exactly right as they spin they just you see these flashes just like a lighthouse and when you see deviations in these flashes that are characteristic of something else passing in front of it then you can use that information to measure the um the relative orbit of this pulsar this rotating neutron star and whatever its companion is and is that because so, the star that passes in front of it is is it literally because it passes in front of it, or or because the neutron star is so massive that it warps the light passing by it? The former. So we okay. do see gravitational lensing. Also, that's uh, another that's right. way that we Black can tell. Holes or... The curvature of space time bends everything. So it's not just the Earth moving around the sun. It's also light. So anything with mass will curve space time. So you and I sitting here having this conversation, the earth, the moon, the sun, black holes. Um, so we can, we can see this in a, in a really big way on a grand scale with powerful telescopes. You'll see these halos of galaxies. So these are, are galaxies that are not in their original galaxy form, but distorted to, or in a circle around massive objects like stars and black holes. Ah, yes, this is very cool. So, right, this is the the Hulse-Teller binary pulsar experiment. Um, So what you can do if you track the orbit, the the radial orbit of the binary um, pulsar and its companion, um, what you'll see, what you expect to see from general relativity is this very slow decay. So as they orbit around each other, they're emitting gravitational wave radiation, 
and in losing that energy, this is bringing their orbit closer and closer together. And eventually we expect to see them merge, as LIGO did for two black holes back in 2015. Um, so this was one of the, the most powerful examples of the successes of general relativity and the first indirect evidence of gravitational waves was measuring this decaying um, radius, this decaying uh, radial orbit of this pulsar and its companion. It matched directly onto what we'd expect for general, general relativity's predictions and it won them the Nobel Prize. And this was predicted about a hundred years ago uh, by Einstein, but this is the first time that we've been able to, well, corroborate or, you know, tick that box saying, yes, this is indeed true. In a way, I think there are, there have been a lot of um, confirmations of general relativity as a theory. So it, it predicted gravitational waves, it predicted bending of light. So the first major confirmation, I would argue, happened um, in 1919. So this was the Eddington experiment. So the premise is that light will bend according to the, the gravitational field of some massive object. So it should bend around, say, the sun, which is very massive to some measurable degree. Um, so what Eddington did is he noticed that there was a solar eclipse um, that was going to occur in 1919 that... Um, that, so this is when the moon passes over the sun, and this is going to be a total um, eclipse that passed over, I think it was South America and, and Africa. Um, so what they did is they measured the position of the stars that would appear just behind the sun at that time, and then looked for changes in their position that indicate the light from these stars is bent, is warped by the sun's gravitational field. And sure enough, when they took the pictures during the eclipse, they found that light was bending around the sun. And this was arguably the experiment that took Einstein from relative obscurity to widespread fame. Ah, so while everyone was just looking at the, you know, the pretty picture in the sky, uh, you know, the the eclipse, physicists were like, ignore that. Let's look at the stars. Let's see if this. <laughs> let's see if they change. Well, there were there were two teams. So one. So they they were just in case of cloud cover. I think they. Um, oh, yeah. They hedged their bets. There was uh, an expedition off the west coast of Africa, and then another one in South America, I think. Yeah, I don't remember where in South America, That's but there thinking. were two. That's good thinking, because yeah. the last thing you'd want is, oh, sorry guys, bad weather, we'll just wait for the next eclipse. In 1919, imagine how much time it would have taken them to get there. Yeah, seriously. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yes. In the name of science. <laughs> yes. So just to clarify, so these gravitational waves are caused by two massive objects um, either coming really, really closely together or in fact colliding. Is that right? And they just, and this causes very slight but still measurable disturbances in the fabric of space time, which propagate out at this, uh, at the speed of light um, into the universe. Yes, wow, well remembered. So gravitational waves are caused by any acceleration of asymmetric matter. So you can't see me doing it, but I'm I'm waving my hand around, and that's making uh, that was very very one tiny. Of my question. So even we, um, <laughs> like any massive objects, does any you know massive object does cause some disturbance in space time, and that and theoretically it would cause um, you know perturbations in. Um, the fabric of space time so it would cause gravitational waves but they would just be so small that we can't we can't measure them and if we did if we could measure them there would be so many uh, there'd be so much noise from everything else that it would just not make that much sense anyway that's right so with the exception of a spinning sphere so just imagine that your bowling ball on your trampoline is spinning and it's not causing distortions in the, the surface of your trampoline any motion, any acceleration of asymmetric matter anywhere will cause gravitational waves, but they're so small, they're so tiny, that we have no hope of no hope. observing them. So it takes the, the most massive objects in the universe moving very, very fast, so black holes and compact objects like neutron stars. So neutron stars, I don't know if I said these are the, the dense cores of dead stars that have gone supernova that are made mostly of neutrons. I think something like a tablespoon of, of neutron matter that composes of these stars 
weighs something tremendous many 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 tons it just breaks your head so. sometimes just yeah. thinking about this sort of stuff like we just we just get all this matter and push it together and it can cause you know just things that we can't even <laughs> comprehend with our mere human minds but uh that's what makes it so exciting and fun to th- fun to learn about well i agree <laughs> yeah i'm glad i'm glad i'm sure you do um what was I going to ask? Um, okay, so the so we, we were talking about the the size or you know the the magnitude of of these gravitational waves, um, and that the ones that we cause are so tiny that you know they're basically immeasurable. So how uh, precise of a measurement do does LIGO produce, and you know at, at what scale are we talking, and how is it done? Oh, so this is cool. So. LIGO can measure, well, first I should probably back up and say that when gravitational waves pass, they cause the stretching and squeezing of space-time. So space-time, as a gravitational wave propagates through the Earth, will cause the space around us to squeeze in one direction while it stretches in another, and then it will go back to um, its regular form, and then it will squeeze and stretch in the other direction in this oscillating way, and this is the effect of our passing gravitational waves. So the the LIGO interferometers, they can sense changes in strain, so this uh, change in length divided by length, of up to 10,000 times smaller than the diameter of a proton. 10,000 times smaller than the diameter of a proton, is that what you said? That's right. It's sort of like equivalent to sensing a change in length, the width of a human hair from here to the nearest star. Oh, casual. Besides our sun. Alpha Centauri. <laughs> wow. So, if everything is stretching, then how do we know if anything is stretching? Like, how does the LIGO actually? How, how does it? How do we measure this? If if the light itself, like, because it it would cause light itself to to stretch and warp. Is that right? That is a very sophisticated question. This is. Uh... This is the question in terms of how does does Lego work? Okay, so yeah, let me yeah. just try. Uh... How does this? And just <laughs> it's one of the most um, well, it's the most accurate instrument ever built, right? Like this is it kind of breaks your mind thinking about the how far we've gone in 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 creating these or these these two structures or whatever you'd like to call them, because when you're me- when you're measuring something that's that small. You need to be pretty precise. Indeed, an understatement. Yes, the, <laughs> the detectors are something of an engineering marvel. Ask me about the vacuum systems; those are cool. But um, so, just in terms of how do they work? So you have this laser beam, and it shoots out this coherent light. And coherence is important because we're we're when we get back to it, essentially going to be looking at differences in phase. And coherence means that all of the light that you're emitting by this laser is all in phase. So you start out with this one laser beam, and then you split it with a beam splitter. So 50% of it goes down one way, and then the other 50% goes down another orthogonal arm. So you're sampling... And are they perpendicular? That's right. So these are two perpendicular degrees of freedom. So remember we said that space-time is being stretched and squeezed in orthogonal directions. So that's what motivates... This and, perpendicular. And, sorry, orthogonal. Um, well, what does that mean? Uh, perpendicular is probably close enough for our purposes. Okay. Okay. All right. So we have our light. It's been split. So half of it is traveling down one of the arms of our perpendicularly shaped detector, and the other half is traveling down the other. So when they get back to the beam splitter, so they're reflected off of mirrors at the ends of these arms. They're four kilometers long, by the way. So they recombine at the beam splitter, and if in a, in a simplistic kind of cartoonish version of how this works, um, if there's no change in relative length between the two arms, then they'll deconstructively interfere. So if you've ever thought about the way waves add together, mm-hmm. if you add them just, just right, then you can get them to cancel out. So we have this photodiode on the other side of this beam splitter, and it's it's not reading any signal. There are no photons in this photodiode. But then what happens when a gravitational wave comes by is you get this relative change in length between the two arms, 
which means that the light that's traveled in one of the arms relative to the other one is now out of phase. And this introduces this interference pattern, and this is what we read in our photodiode. It's this interference pattern of light that traces our the space-time strain, this passing gravitational wave amplitude. Ah, oh, that's ingenious. And it still hasn't answered your question about why does it work, because <laughs> as you said, um, doesn't, doesn't the light itself, the wavelength of light itself change? Isn't it also warped by the stretching and squeezing of space-time? And you're absolutely right. But general relativity is weird and not intuitive. So the, the solution to this thought problem is to think of the timing of each one of the wave fronts. So let's say you have some wave, and let's call the peak of the wave to be or the point of interest, our, uh, our wave front. So the time between each one of these peaks is always going to be the same because the speed of light is constant. So even though there's more space between them, you still get this this phase evolution. So it's not like you're taking the light and stretching and squeezing it like the like an accordion. As time evolves, because the speed of light is constant, your wave fronts are still going to be traveling at the same speed, and you're still going to get a phase difference. And that's why the measurement works. Okay, so because um, even though the speed is constant, there is a very very slight disturbance in. Well, does the distance change at all? Is is, is that yes. so? And the that's and that's the issue. That well, that, that that's that's what allows us to make the measurement even though the, the distance is you know extremely extremely tiny it's measurable due to the accuracy or the precise well, you know the precision of these instruments indeed okay. it's a, a small phase change but measurable but measurable and that's the important part well that's awesome congratulations to you and everyone working on on this and well and, and on the and respect to the the engineers as well who put this thing together, and everyone who thought about this, because it sounds like a bit of a mind brain, a mind bending problem. I would say so. Yeah. I think the first designs came about decades ago, more than three decades, I think. Wow. So, what is the significance of this discovery? Because I've heard that, you know, it, it gives us an entirely new way of looking at the universe. Could you just expand on, on what that means and perhaps how we look at the universe currently and how this has how this might change things? Sure. So pretty much since the dawn of time, humans have been looking up at the sky with light. We've relied on light to tell us everything that we've known about the structure of our universe and how matter was made and our place in it up until now, up until this discovery. So uh, light... We've expanded through um, lots of technological technological advances um, what kinds of light we can see. So in addition to visible light that we can see with our eyes, which does tell us a lot about particularly uh, the galaxy around us and our solar system. So we now have instruments that can sense light at pretty much all wavelengths. We can see gamma rays, which are very energetic, all the way down to radio waves, which can tell us about this, you know, the very low frequency motion of the universe and also perhaps um, its origins from the Big Bang. We have instruments in space. We have instruments on the ground. They've been able to tell us a great deal, many things, all of which are to be celebrated. But it's sort of like you're just using one sense if you're only using light, because like we've said before, Light follows space-time, light interacts, light is obscured by dust, by other matter, by other light, light is bent by gravity, so it's this, it's limited in some ways, so what gravitational waves allow us to do is see with this totally different sense, and people like to make the analogy, it's sort of like being able to hear in addition to being able to see. So now you have these waves, these gravitational waves that are extremely weakly interacting. So it's giving us this first glimpse behind the matter and the dust and the light into the inner dynamics of these extremely energetic astrophysical phenomena. Okay. And is there anything um, now that this, now that, you know, gravitational waves have been discovered and all that, is there anything that you're particularly excited about or 
there, there might be one application or you know um, one field of inquiry that yeah, I know you're, you're very excited about. Well, I think we're most excited about becoming an observatory, as it is stated in our name, the LIGO Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. So we we get this question a lot, which is, you know, you've you've discovered gravitational waves, you've confirmed this element of general relativity. So what now? What are you going to do now? Just keep on and watching. We hope, that's right. We hope to operate just like a telescope. So we've already made some really useful, I would argue, contributions to astrophysics as it stands. So we talked a little bit about binary objects in the universe. So one of and another binary kind being, of so like. It, was, was that, I wonder, yeah, when you were referring to the the neutron star and the pulsar, that they, they're a binary star system. Or... So you can have a binary with any pair of astrophysical objects. Mm -hmm. Just two. just means two. That's right. Um, so another interesting kind of binary pair is a black hole and a companion star. So what can happen within a certain radius of the star to the black hole? is that some of the outflowing matter from the star will start to swirl in and get eaten up by the black hole. And this results in these powerful emissions of X-ray beams, which we can observe. And whenever you get the companion star crossing in front of these powerful emissions, then you can measure things like the orbit radius and the orbital period. And from that, you can infer the mass of the black hole. So we have been able to make these preliminary indirect measurements of black hole masses using light, but they'd only ever, so there are maybe a couple dozen of these recorded, and they've only ever indicated black holes up to about 20 solar masses or so, so 20 times greater than the mass of our sun. Okay. And then you had this huge gap between those sort of solar mass black holes, these kind of lower mass black holes, and these supermassive black holes where you're looking at the interior dynamics of um, the inner parts of galaxies to infer the mass of the supermassive black holes that live there. So what LIGO was able to do with its very first detection is show that there is indeed a distribution of black holes that fall within this gap. So our first detection was two roughly 30 solar mass black holes, both already above this former 20 solar mass limits that merge to form a roughly 60 solar mass black hole. So this is one of the bigger solar mass type um, black holes that we've, that's ever been seen before by a, a very large margin. And this happened 1.4 billion years before LIGO recorded the signal. So and it were we just kind of lucky that we were there or just, do these things happen so often? How, how often do you get readings? So this is a question that we're hoping to answer. No one, it's it's not well understood what the expected rate of these pairs are. So we, we certainly observe them um, out in the universe. You see pairs of binary neutron stars. And from there, if you assume some things, assume some things about star formation, about star evolution, and then about the distribution of stars in the universe, you can sort of get a picture of how many pairs that you might see of black holes and neutron stars. And then from that how often they might merge, but this was the, the expected rates varied from these theoretical predictions by several orders of magnitude. So LIGO will be able to provide the first real measure of the rate at which we're, we should be seeing these events. Okay. Will we be able to deduce the relationship between you know, the changes in the fabric of space time, or you know, the size of these waves, if if you know, size is even the way best way of saying it, um, and the mass associated with it, like will we be able to find the relationship between mass and disturbances in space time? Because that'd be pretty cool, just to know how much mass can cause a certain wave or gravitational wave. Does that make sense? It does indeed, and we certainly can. And so. We, we get this kind of astonishment from astronomer colleagues that were able to measure so precisely the, the mass and distance of our signals, but we don't have to deal with any of these contaminants, this intergalactic dust, this you know matter in between us and our, our signals. So general relativity predicts exactly what that waveform should look like for whichever component masses. So if you have a 
a black hole of 30 solar masses and another one of 30 solar masses, that will make a unique and extremely predictable time series evolution. So that will, it's, it's sort of the way the wiggles wiggle. If I measure this wave, this time series, I can infer from the phase evolution, the, the time frequency evolution of it, exactly what the masses were. And then once I know what the masses were, then I know what the amplitude should have been. And then from that and the amplitude that I measured, I can infer the distance. That's, it's pretty cool that you know, because you're measuring something that's so hard to measure that when you actually do measure it, there's not much out there that's actually going to interfere with it. Yes, just so. So I get my, my next question is if like do these, let's say, I mean, we're at one point in the universe, but there's um, stuff, you know, in 360 degrees and all, you know, up, down, left, right, everywhere. Do these waves, like, how do you know that these waves aren't um, basically interfering with one another? So let's say, you know, um, we've got one, uh, two black holes that, you know, collide or that, that merge um, a billion light years on the left and the same thing happens a billion light years on the right and the waves come together. Like, how do we know that um, what we're reading is not a combination of multiple or um or you know if they're not interfering with one another so you can also think of this like the ripples in the pond if i throw a stone into the pond at one location and you throw a stone in at another location some third party observer should be able to infer something about what we both did from this other position just looking at the motion of the water where they are so we don't ex we expect them to be rare enough that getting two that interfere at the same time is probably not something that we're two strong signals that happen at the same time is not very likely. But what we do expect to see is this stochastic background, this kind of popcorn signal of a lot of these going off very faintly at many different places far, far away in the universe. And is there anything, like, do these waves lose energy with time or is there a i don't know how they would but or would they just go on forever is is this pond this big you know universal pond just going to be constantly rippling ah they do decay so just like our trampoline our our stretched space-time fabric has some elasticity to it so yes and that that causes them to decay um so Unlike and what does that unlike, decay into? What 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 does what does that energy get transferred into? So, if we come back to our pond analogy, so as these waves are interacting and displacing our water, um, so acting on this matter and interacting with this matter um, causes them to lose energy, and the same thing with acting on space time itself. So they'll they'll decrease in amplitude or decay as um, as we say, um, and it's it's inversely proportional to the distance traveled. So unlike light, which is inversely proportional to that distance squared, so if you have some star that's shining, um, the amount of light you see is proportional to the number of photons. So if you draw a sphere around that star um, and you take a certain percentage of that sphere, some portion, let's say 30%, I draw a little arc, that's 30%, some certain number of photons will come through that little arc. And now if I do that again, but like 100 kilometers or 1,000 light years away, if I draw a sphere and then gave 30% in the same shape, then you'd get far, far fewer photons. And that's it's this area effect that gives you this 1 over distance squared as opposed to 1 over distance. Alrighty, well, I think um, I think we'll wrap up there. Um, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to chat, especially considering the the technical difficulties. Um, just for those listening, I was just saying that it's ironic that well, basically, it took us about half an hour to end up getting the Skype call working, and uh, it's just ironic that when we're talking about one of the most you know the greatest technical achievements of all time, we can't even get Skype working. <laughs> Technology. Technology. All right, Jess. Well, thank you very much for, for being on the show. Thank you for having me. And I want to advertise to any interested listeners out there, if you want to get involved, please go to gravityspy.org and you can help us classify our noise sources. So this is a way to oh, help us. Crowdsourcing science. Yes. Yes, love, citizen love science. It. Awesome. Yes. And I'm sorry, I uh, forgot to mention, um, 
is there anything else that you'd like to say to the people listening out there other than the the, the great plug or um, if people want to find out more um, where should they where, where do you think they should head to well LIGO is also uh, certainly worth a Google um, we have this wonderful LIGO Open Science Center so if you're uh, you know, doing some kind of project. If you're a you know, science fair or college physics major and you want to grab some Lego data and do some cool things with it, there are some pretty cool tutorials there. You should go check them out. And Lego is brought to you by the National Science Foundation in the United States and a hundred different institutions in the Lego Scientific Collaboration over five continents and something like 1,200 members from many, many, many different countries. So it's a, it's a huge international collaboration and a really good example of science without borders. Mm. Ah, I love that message. It's, um, it's amazing. It's a great example of humanity coming together to do just mind-boggling things. Yeah, absolutely. We have colleagues working on the project from... Mexico, Iran, Russia, Uruguay, let's see, India, Thailand, I think Bangladesh too, uh, China, Hungary, South Korea, probably many, many other countries that I can't think of off the top of my head. That's great. So thank you again to Jess for taking the time to have a chat. I hope you enjoyed our discussion. There is definitely some sort of Yo Mama joke to be found in this science. But anyway... If you enjoyed the discussion, or if you'd like to support the podcast and YouTube channel, head to patreon.com slash talkoftoday. I will not be running any ads on any of this content, so your support is greatly appreciated and instrumental to the creation of this content. That being said, I will plug some of the stuff I'm working on, because shit, if I can't do that here, what can I do it? Uh, so the Chrome extension, the to-do list uh, productivity plan, a Chrome extension that I've been working on, I've decided to call LifeTab, is now available on the Chrome store. Uh, you can just type in LifeTab um, into the Chrome uh, search box and it should pop up. Or head to talkoftoday.com slash LifeTab or just head to talkoftoday.com and it will be in the sidebar of most of the posts. So what it is is basically a a to-do list slash life tracker that pops up every single time you open up a new tab. And uh, I've been using it for a couple months and I've stuck with it. Basically, I've built it to, uh, because it, it's the the Chrome extension or it's the app that I wish existed. So I went ahead and made it. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy it as well. And all feedback is uh, greatly appreciated. Basically, I've released this beta version because I want to see if it's going to deliver enough value to people. And if people do value it, then... I would like to continue with it and create the product that we all want to use. So your feedback is instrumental to making this a reality because together we can basically create this uh, this extension. So um, thank you for listening and um, stay tuned for future podcasts because they were very exciting to, uh, to record, especially the ones on um, anti-aging and uh, the future of food. And they'll be coming up over the next few weeks. So stay tuned and... Um, Head to the head to the YouTube channel as well, which is Talk of Today, uh, because we've got some cool content coming out. So uh, your support is always appreciated, and I'm signing out. Goodbye.